Well, Commissioner Long continues to work on her technical issues. Um, so I'd like to invite Reverend J.C. Pritchett from Faith Church St. Petersburg to come on up for the invocation. And if we could please stand, and if Commissioner Scott would lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance after. Welcome. Thank you. Let's pray. Almost a million of us reside in Pinellas County, some in mansions, others in mobile homes, some sleep feeling the breeze on the beaches, others on windy park benches, white, black, brown, men, women, young, older, working, wealthy, entrepreneurs, and students. All of us depend on you, your staff, and numerous county employees for our safety, for transportation, for water, for housing, for support, and for your leadership. As we set out on this new year together, our prayer is that God keeps you safe and healthy, that God uses your gifts, talents, and experiences to guide our county, that God bless you, bless your family, blesses those that you care and are concerned about, that each of you are strengthened, encouraged, and continually find peace as you bear these enormous challenges and responsibilities on your backs, minds, and hearts. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you again. Next, we have presentations and awards. And um, I'm really excited about this employee uh, recognition. There we go. Thank you. So every quarter we recognize an individual or, or several individuals or a team for outstanding accomplishments and service to our residents. Today, we are proud to present an award to the Financial Service Divisions in Safety and Emergency Services. This team oversees billing for each Sunstar ambulance transport, as well as the finances for the rest of the department. They took on the challenge of increasing the collections from insurance companies. In fiscal year 2023, the financial service divisions increased the ambulance program revenue from $80 million to $93 million. That was an increase of $13 million from fiscal year 2022, and I assure you this is no easy task. A huge amount of work went into this, and the results have been incredibly remarkable. I'd like to invite the team to join me while we watch a video about their achievement. Please come on up and wow. When those sirens sound in Pinellas County, we often think of the potentially life-saving efforts of the team inside those ambulances. But behind them is another team, also working to support that patient's care. The Safety and Emergency Services Financial Services Division. Most of the time when you end up in an ambulance, it's not, a, it's not a fun day. So typically those people are sick, they're vulnerable, and we want the patients to be able to focus on their health and well-being. They come to work with every day knowing they're helping somebody who's had a tragedy. So the burden of getting an ambulance bill is something we take pride in to ensure they get their ambulance bill paid the way it should be by their insurance plan. To meet rising costs and changes in the healthcare industry, the financial services team changed their process with the goal of increasing collections by 5%. Instead, they collected more than double that, collecting on 80% of claims, the highest of any major ambulance service in the country. This helps keep tax rates low and enhance patient care. His transports are scheduled. We have him scheduled for three days a week. Assisting with transports and advocating for you to your insurance company are just some of the ways this team is working to serve Pinellas County residents and visitors. The regulations and navigating the system that's always changing is very challenging. And so I think when we are able to help a patient navigate their plan and get their claim paid and not have to worry about the bill, I think that's what makes our team special. We're their ally. We have purpose in what we do, and the job is bigger than us. 
We are actually the arms, the hands, the mouthpiece for a lot of our patients who can't do that on their own. So it makes you think about your own mother and father and grandmother in hopes that someone would do the same thing for them. It's rewarding because they get the help that they need, that they get the care that they need, and we had a hand in providing them that. Everybody shares the same passion to provide the best service possible to the citizens and visitors of Pinellas County. And at the end of the day, we're proud that we generate revenue that supports one of the best EMS systems in the country. And I truly believe that. Nice work, Pinellas County Safety and Emergency Services Financial Services Division. Outstanding, outstanding. You wanna say something? Well, this is, this is a small portion of the team, you know, but they, they come to work every day and they work really, really hard at keeping the taxes low, but helping out, you know, our residents. And, and I will tell you, when, when Jody come a uh, short time ago and said, we need another position, you know, where your dander goes up and you, you know, but th they said, we're going to bring in a million dollars. Well, they brought in way more than a million dollars just out of that one position. So anytime you can do, have that type of results, but they've done so much more. They've outsourced Medicaid portions and things that are really complex. And they, they just really look at running an efficient group that brings down, you know, and keeps our taxes low. And, and, and like I said, gets our, our residents um, bills paid. So great job for the entire team. And we're very, very proud of you. Do you, anybody have anything to say? And your interviews were great, great. And, and I just, I've, if, uh, if any patient that's been transported, they are, I know they are so incredibly grateful to you and your work. I just want to uh, thank the team, the team back at the office uh, working right now who are not here, and um, thank our leadership team, Jim Fogarty, Lourdes Benedict, and Barry Burton for supporting our initiatives. Without the support, this wouldn't have been made possible. Anybody else have something to say? No. So I have proclamations for each of you. Um, and then we also have a certificate. And please share with all of your team um, back at the office. And, uh, and hopefully you all will hang this very proudly. So we have this um, recognition for you as well. And we're going to take a photograph if that's OK. Now, I'd love to hear reports like that every single month. That would be amazing. So I would like to invite Mrs. Gloria Campbell to join me up here. It's good to see you. Welcome. And you've received this with us before. We have. It's That's about what I third thought. Year. <laughs> well, it's good to see you and have you back. And what a great thing to celebrate to come back for. Thank you. So um, today um, we have a proclamation for the Martin Luther King Day. Um, and Ms. Campbell is the executive director for the Clearwater Urban League Coalition here in Clearwater. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. devoted his life to advancing equality, social justice, and opportunity for all, and challenged all Americans to participate in the never-ending work of building a more perfect and just union. Dr. King's teaching continued to guide and inspire us in addressing challenges and injustices within our communities, including educational opportunity, academic achievement, 
economic empowerment, and the elimination of poverty. The King Holiday and Service Act, enacted by Congress in 1994, designated Dr. King Holiday as a National Day of Volunteer Service. Millions of Americans have honored the life and legacy of Dr. King by serving their neighbors and communities on this holiday through service projects that are organized by various nonprofits, community, public, and private organizations. The county recognizes that the legacy of Dr. King lives on through the tremendous work of many community organizations, including the Clearwater Urban League Coalition. Now, therefore, be it complained by, proclaimed by the Pinellas County Board of County Commissioners that January 15, 2024, be recognized as Dr. Martin Luther King Day. And it is such a pleasure to have you here again you. and I want to present that with you. And if the commissioners would like to come up again, Oh, that's wonderful. If you'd all like to come and join us. It's good to have you all here. Well, that concludes our presentations and awards this morning. Thank you all for coming. Move on to Citizens to be Heard. So Ron Englert, if he would come up, and then next will be Chris Peterson. Ron, we'd ask that you um, state your name and your address, and you'll have three minutes. My name is Ron Englert. I live at 1612 St. Charles Drive in Dunedin. Um, and I'm here to talk about the um, bridges for uh, bicycles on the Dunedin Causeway. Um, they're telling bicyclists to dismount and walk across the bridges. When they originally put them up, there was three bridges up there, and they put them on all three. So they've since taken them down from two of them and left them on one. Um, when I called to see why they had been put up, um, I was told that it was because they received a lot of complaints. Um, I then asked how many complaints they'd received over the last couple of years, and I didn't get any answers, so I filed a public records request, and it turns out that they only have a record of one person complaining. There are no police reports, there's no nothing showing that there's any accidents or any danger out there at all. Those dismount signs replaced signs that said for bikers to yield to pedestrians, which is in accordance with state law, and uh, um, so far as I know, there have never been any tickets issued for, that, for any infractions of that either, but they very well could. Um, there were, last January, according to Florida Pinellas statistics, there were 46,000 trail users in Dunedin. Now, we don't have them on the causeway itself because nobody bothered to take any data or try to collect any information about it. But if, and most of those, most of those users are, are bicyclists, by the way. In January, it was 83% of the trail users were on bikes. Now, to get out to the Dunedin causeway, um, well, at least, you know, say 10% of them do, you're turning away probably thousands in the, in the number of thousands of people who won't go out there anymore because, as the way the county presented it to me, you, well, you could always ride in the road. The problem with riding in the road is those lanes are only about 12 feet wide. You just can't fit a car and a bike in a lane like that. There's not enough room. There's not really even a shoulder there. Um, and if you're trying to pedal up the hill and there's a car, the car wants to pass you and you're only going six or eight miles an hour and a car's coming the other way, you know who's going to get hurt. It's going to be the person on a bike. Um, 
So anyways, the, co the county, it seems like they put it up without, without collecting any data. They didn't send any of the sheriff's patrols out there that are on bikes to say, here, what's the situation? Um, after the bikes, after the signs were put up, there was even one Penthouse County Sheriff's officer who said, I think he patrols out there regularly, who said there's a, been a, there's a noticeable number of people, an increase in the number of people riding in the road. Um, you all know that a couple years ago, Wall Street Journal labeled Pinellas County the most dangerous county in the country for bicyclists. Not the state, in the country. And having people go out on the roadway is a step in, a, in the other directions. Now, of course you can try to walk, but if you're 70, 65, 70, whatever years old, try to push a 65-pound e-bike over that thing. It's just not possible. It's just not feasible. So what's happening is most people are just not going. So effectively, Dunedin, uh, Honeymoon Island and the causeway have been cut off from literally thousands of bikers. Now, that's it. Sorry. Thanks for your time. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Hey, Chris Peterson, and then next up will be Lee H. Jacobs. Morning, Commissioners. My name is Chris Peterson for Fortify Financial, 800 Waterford Way, Miami, Florida. Uh, Fortify is a PACE provider here in Florida. I'm here to address an ongoing issue between the FPFA, uh, the Florida PACE Funding Agency in Pinellas County and its tax collector, uh, as well as several other counties and tax collectors around the state. Uh, as you may know, back in late 2022, the FPFA completed a judicial bond validation, which included a preemption clause allowing them to operate statewide. My company, Fortify, is a PACE provider under the FPFA. However, Fortify does not have any influence over the actions of the FPFA, uh, nor did we have anything to do with the judicial bond validation. Uh, at the time that the FPFA got the judicial bond validation, Fortify uh, provided that validation to our outside counsel, and based on years of extensive case law, they opined it was valid, and we began in good faith uh, on reliance of the court's validation order. After Fortify had financed these projects, a tax collector advised the FPFA that these assessments would not be included on the property tax bills. Now, to clarify, I do not represent FPFA or its interests. I represent Fortify Financial and its affected customers and contractors, and I am here to help solve this issue so your constituents can be spared from the crossfire of an intergovernmental dispute. Um, so we cannot pay the contractors for the PACE projects that they have started or completed without assurance that the assessment will be on the tax roll. And your tax collector has indicated that they would include those with, uh, they wouldn't include them without an ILA. So our proposed solution to this problem is a curative ILA, a short-term agreement that only encompasses the affected homeowners, allowing those assessments originated during that specific period of time to be placed on the tax rolls. So the projects can be finished and funded and our customers can repay this obligation in the manner they anticipated through the tax roll. I can send around a draft copy of the curative ILA after the meeting for your consideration. So we started originating assessments of good faith based on that judicial bond validation. Uh, clearly, uh, there are some disagreements about that and the courts or the legislature is gonna solve that issue but we still have to, this issue of, of, of how to take care of, these, of your constituents and our customers. So again, we can resolve this with the curative ILA. I'll provide it to you, and I hope that we can find a way to resolve this. And I stand ready to, uh, to work with you offline. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Lee Jacobs, and then it will be Jeff Yeager. Good morning. Morning. My address is 16300 Gulf Boulevard, Reddington Beach. I'm here to inquire what the commission plans to do about the beach erosion on Reddington Beach. I appeared before you in December, and I appear before you again now. In December, we had another storm which came through and did additional damage. I can't imagine that this commission wants to preside over the destruction of Reddington Beach and it's not going to be enough in hindsight to come in for a photo opportunity with the president or the governor to say, I'm gonna, we're going to repair everything. People think it's for free. If FEMA gives you a, comes in and repairs your property, they have a lien on your property. You have to pay that money back. Wouldn't it be wise to spend the money now to repair the beach and avoid this problem? And I find it very disconcerting that I have tried to get in touch with members of this committee and nobody returns a telephone call. I find that to be very inconsiderate and I can't fathom it. I'm no danger to anybody. 
please have the decency to return some phone calls. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I don't have your phone call on or your phone number on here, but if you'd put it on here, I'd be happy to give you a call back. But I can tell you, I believe very later in your report, you're going to talk about the beach. So later in the meeting, there will be a discussion about an update on the beaches. And so um, if you want to pay attention and watch that, and then I'll have uh, Nick give this to you to put your phone number down and I'll follow up with you. Okay. Thank you. Um, It'll all be discussed later. Um, Barry, did you want to say something? You just want to wait. Well, I usually don't respond on public comment, but you I know, know I, I did have this conversation with the gentleman. Okay, I did respond to him. Um, you know, it's a tough situation, obviously, and, yes. and he wants us to use um, you know those types of powers because we were unable to get easements from the property owners. That's the issue with Reddington Beach, um, and I don't disagree with him, but we're in a tough spot because of the lack of easements. Okay, and I know there'll be more that you're gonna yeah. update on, and uh, and yes, it is difficult. So, um, Jeff Yeager, if you wanna come up again, uh, your name and your address, and you have three minutes. Good morning, my name is Jeff Yeager. I live at 32 Baywood Drive, Palm Harbor, Florida, which is uh, in Baywood 5 uh, subdivision. My, we're on here the conversation of the Crosswinds Bridge Project, the debacle that we've been going through. I have some other residents that are going to come up and speak behind me, but I just want to give a little brief history. We're not going to beat a dead horse on the whole project, but um, from day one, we've been going on from, for three years. This has been going on. The storage problem along Crosswinds Drive that I addressed in the very beginning, that they took uh, the materials from the West Winds Bridge and just dumped it on the easement on uh, Crosswinds Drive. I was told that it was um, cost too much money. It would be labor intense to go out there and organize them. The, storage things. Um, as far as notification, when they did start the bridge project with heavy equipment coming in, the residents got no notice that there would be bridge closers and delays for up to 30 minutes. We had a sewer spill on uh, Sunrise Drive, which is a result from that. What ran for, uh, what was it, 12 hours? There was no notification to residents, just a sign put up that uh, don't swim in the canal. There's still debris underneath the bridge that needs to be addressed. Um, I've contacted um, Robert Mentor and Mr. Edgar's office several times. The last update I got from uh, the project manager, Robert, was that there's no information at this time. We were told that we would be follow up from Mr. Edgar's office. That's never happened. Um, we just not, we're not going to beat a dead horse. We just need a date for completion. I probably have a lot more information than what y'all do because one resident has contacts and spent a half a day last week trying to get information about the, the company, which is evidently now in bankruptcy. But we just need a date. We've got debris along the side of the road that's been there for years. We've had a one-lane bridge for over a year, which caused uh, numerous complaints in the neighborhood. We had neighbors arguing with each other. It would be a, sometimes when you go across the bridge, you have runners running the red light, and who's going to back up and back and forth. But not to dwell on that, just as a resident of Baywood 5 and Homer and uh, Baywood Village, we just need a completion date on the bridge. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Mike Driscoll, and after Annette Spiker. Mike Driscoll here. Okay, is Annette Spiker here? After Annette would be Jeanette Creed. Go ahead and get started. Okay. Good morning. My name is Annette Spiker, and I live at 95 East Winds Court in Baywood Village in Palm Harbor, uh, Florida. I'm here today with other Baywood Village residents concerning dangerous, hazardous waste, debris, and abandoned equipment from the Crosswinds Bridge project that has been assigned CATS, County Assignment Tracking System 55119. Baywood Village residents have been held captive for three years now by an unscrupulous contractor who is currently in default on their Pinellas County, Florida construction contracts, leaving people with dangerous rubble and debris in their yards and a triangle 
staging area that contains flammable hazardous waste and an unsanitary, smelly, unserviced portable toilet, construction equipment, etc. We are aware that our concerns regarding this dangerous rubble and debris have now been escalated up within agencies of Pinellas County and believe that CATS 55119 was opened due to our collective concerns being raised. Prior to this, we believe the county was primarily focused on dealings with the defaulting contractor. Therefore, we as a community are compelled to increase our visibility and get on the public record in order to clean up our neighborhood, reclaim our properties, and seek reparations where they are due. Many who were unable to attend in person today requested to sign a petition in support of the message that is being delivered. The petition has 230 original signatures from Baywood Village residents that are being submitted to the board this morning. Baywood Village residents are seeking resolution from Pinellas County on at least four separate issues. One, completion of the Crosswinds Bridge project. The update from last Friday is that the county has approved a 10-day extension for AEB to show measurable progress on the Crosswinds Bridge project before the county determines whether to continue or terminate the contract. AEB has already turned an 18-month project into a three-year catastrophe. How many more opportunities or extensions are they going to get? Every extension they receive, every accommodation they get, has a direct negative impact to our residents. AEB has not only devastated our neighborhood, some residents believe that they observed the construction crew using salt water out of the canal to mix cement while building the bridge, which, if true, would compromise the safety and integrity of the bridge. That's a topic for a future discussion on a future date. Two, immediately taking action to clean up our neighborhood of the dangerous debris and stench. Agents of the county have understandably expressed concerns over items in the debris field being thrown away, hauled off, or even disturbed due to legal fallout, potentially giving the contractor a reason to sue the county over loss of their property. What about the residents who just want their properties back? What about the children who want to play in their neighborhood? Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jeanette, Cre after Jeanette, it's uh, Ann Betsy Rutkowski. Hi, my name is Jeanette Creedy. I live on 326 Crosswinds Drive. And uh, I wasn't expected to speak today, but I am with my neighbors um, speaking about the Crosswinds Bridge project. This was a project that started three years ago. It was supposed to be done in 18 months. The contractor has defaulted, and the job is not done. There is debris around the neighborhood. People's homes are not completed. Um, workers, they, you know, even during the project, they didn't really show up, you know, um, and it's just ongoing. And we're looking for a path forward um, to complete this job. It's just, it's been abandoned, and um, we're looking for the county to help to assist and um, help get this project completed. So thank you. Thank you. I also want to thank Annette for the photographs. Um, they really, it really makes a difference when someone says there's debris and then you see, a, you know, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, Betsy Rutkowski. And next would be David Ballad Geddes. I'm Betsy Rutkowski on 321 Crosswinds Drive, Palm Harbor. Oh, sorry. 321 uh, Crosswinds Drive, Betsy Rutkowski. Um, I'm on the same subject with the Crosswinds Bridge. Again, it was supposed to be 18 months. They told us all these, promised all these things that were gonna happen. Um, we're concerned about the integrity of the bridge, by the way it was made by this defaulting contractor. Um, and we want that to be looked into as well. As we said, there's a petition with 230 residents that are complaining about all of the problems we've had. It's gone over three years. It's now a community joke. Someone even dressed up as Halloween with signs that were at the bridge of all the different things that we've in, went through in the last um, three years. Um, I also wanted to take note, as we do clean up, 
Um, I was one of the spearheads from, you may remember, the beautification project the county put back a few years ago. Our community was one of those. So we had residents that raised, I think it was just a little over $30,000 of our own money to put into the beautification of that area. And the county put in, I think it was $60,000, $75,000. They put in new curbing, we put in new um, plants and trees, and we, we made the, the triangle that they're referencing that you're seeing the pictures of used to look like a park. Residents would come and sit with their dogs and meet in this area, and now it's just a dump. So not only do we want it restored, we want it restored back to the park-like way that it was to our community. Um, we had curbing that we had put in, we had irrigation that was put in, all kinds of things, and it's all destroyed. So not only do we want you to clean it up, but we want you to clean it up in a manner in which it was before. And you would have record of the beautification projects back then. Um, also, at that same time, we did a dredging project where we raised, I think it was over $80,000, whereas residents put in money for dredging in different areas, of, and that under that bridge was one of those points. Now it's filled with debris and crap from the people who came. So it was total disrespect to the community. They put things on people's lawns. They, they, there was, it was just trash everywhere. We had a one-way with a stoplight on the bridge that was a two-way bridge, so we would stop. We would come out of our residence our only way out and not be able to leave for 30, 40 minutes at times, which is extremely dangerous because one of the reasons why they said we needed to replace that bridge in the way it was in the first place was so that ambulances and fire trucks and things could come in. So there was many things that went wrong, but we want to make sure we can't fix what happened, obviously, but when you do fix it, we hope you'll do even more because of all of the residents have gone through at this time because it has been a nightmare and it's been a long time. Thank you. Thank you. David Ballard Geddes, and then next is Greg Pound. Hi, good morning, commissioners. David Ballard Geddes, Jr. I live at 802 Georgia Avenue in Palm Harbor. This government is a government claiming to be of the people, by the people, and for the people, as spoken of by Abraham Lincoln in his Gettysburg Address. The Federalist Papers reveal these three constitutions as the former, the latter, and the last resort. Such people of the former, by the latter, and for the last resort are people seen as being an enumerated class of people, nepotism embedded within Article I, Section 2 of our existing Constitution. Such enumerated members have assailed itself constitutionally as a peacetime ship of war in Article I, Section 10, here to capture land and water seen as an act of reprisal recognized as a letter of marquee in Article I, Section 8, Clause 11. Such peacetime ship of war is seen in the Declaration of Independence as that of one of prudence, a a war of attrition stating that a long train of usurpations, perfidy, and death that mankind is more disposed to suffer while evils are still sufferable. Our current constitution, this war of attrition, is in total violation in and of itself when it constitutes itself as a letter of marquee, as an act of reprisal in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 11, yet simultaneously prohibits such letters of marquee and reprisals in Article 1, Section 10. Our current constitution, this prudent ship of rebellious hypocrisy, is a defective, insurrected, evil war of attrition used as a medium to take liberty, property, and life claimed as due process, giving rise to unwarranted water jurisdictions under the 14th Amendment, intent on vanquishing Christianity as based on Federalist Paper Number 2, blasphemous, in its intent, declaring itself free to levy war, deaf to the voice of justice, deaf to consequentity, 
in the duplicit nature and counterfeiting capacities of the Declaration of Independence, which has juxtaposed itself as preamble to both Hamilton's first and second constitution. This is a refutable act of government, and I stand here, and I have been for 15 years trying to express this issue. Again, I am becoming tired. Thank you. Um. Greg Pound. Greg Pound, Largo, Florida. Um, a couple of verses here. This comes out of Galatians and Corinthians. It says, for we can do nothing against the truth, but only for the truth. Everything we do is going to produce truth. No matter what you do, people are going to, the truth is going to come out. And it says in Proverbs, it says, buy the truth and sell it not. Our goal is to seek the truth Whatever you have to pay, the whole budget, we want nothing but the truth in America. That's what we need in order to survive. Now, Paul said this. He said, am I, therefore, your enemy because I tell you the truth? Am I your enemy because someone's telling you the truth when you're supposed to be paying me to tell you the truth if you have to? Let me tell you this. We are being sexually seduced as a nation. That, that parade yesterday, um, Martin Luther King parade, was, a sh was, a, was so, so, so perverted, I couldn't believe it. It was the same thing as going down to the gay pride parade. When you got the first, all the first floats are gay pride. You got them young girls in the, in the, in the bands dressed like, like well, almost with no clothes on and the way they were dressing and the things they were doing. I just couldn't believe it. It's all sexual overtones. This is our next generation of young people. We're being, their goal is to destroy our family. You go and see who's, who's running our Hollywood, China. And they're pumping this trash in, all this filth, this violence that makes it look like these people can do whatever they want and nothing's going to happen to them. There's no consequences to choices. Listen, you go look at, you look up Bill Gates, you look up Lat Vela up in Tallahassee, and you find out the sexual stuff that was going on in Tallahassee, where they were getting points. If they could seduce a woman that was married, a married woman, they had this game going on in the Senate and, uh, and up there in Tallahassee. These are their next generation. And find out how many of them had, came from divorced families. When you divorce the family and you separate those children from their father and you separate them from their mother because their mother's going to have to work all the time, she can't be a mother. She can't be a home builder. We're under attack as a nation, and the weapon they're using is to destroy us morally. We're being morally destroyed. We're, our families are being destroyed. Our next generation... I mean, we're in big trouble. You go look at the global demographics of the white population. We cannot even reproduce ourselves out of Canada, America, and Europe. We cannot even reproduce ourselves. You can get all the women you want pregnant. We are so down. And I mean, you, you can kill all the black people you've got in America. They've got a million of them in, in Africa. They're not going to stop having their babies, OK? You're not going to convince other cultures to destroy their family and kill their children, like the white culture. The white culture has bought into this, this, this genocide. This is a form of genocide that's happening here in this culture. And it's being pushed by white people. You look what Hitler said. You give us the women, we've got the men and the children. You give us the women, then we've got the men and we've got the children. And that's what they're doing. They're coming in, they're taking over the women, and now the men are following the women or else they're destroying themselves. If we don't stand up and fight for what's right and live by truth and justice and go back to this Bible, we're in trouble. Okay, next we have a public hearing, item number four. Thank you, Madam Chair. Agenda item number four is a proposed ordinance amending Pinellas County Code Chapter 86, which is related to the County Drug Paraphernalia Ordinance, providing for revisions to Section 86106, clarifying definitions to align with recent statutory changes to exclude products for fentanyl testing equipment to promote the health, safety, and welfare of residents. The public hearing was properly advertised, and an affidavit of publication has been received for filing. No correspondence has been received by the clerk, and the matter is properly before the board to be heard. Okay, does anybody have any questions or comments? Okay. We have a, a motion by Commissioner Long, a second by Commissioner Scott. Um, and if you want to go to the board, and we'll pull up the voting card. And it was supposed to come up. <laughs> we got one more vote coming in. Vote, but we're not seeing the results. I 
Who beyond is, my technical Does the clerk office have the results? <laughs> First time using these over here, so yeah. let's uh, see so, how this works. Should we go to a voice vote? Yeah, so all in favor, the, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the motion passes unanimously. Um, we'll go on to consent agenda. However, I do have a, a, a speaker uh, who is pre-registered on Zoom, Leslie Lynchner, and she has issues with number 19 she wants to speak on. Um, so if we'll let her come on first before we go move on to the consent agenda. Is she with us? Leslie Lynchner, are you on Zoom? Can you hear us? If you are, can you please raise your virtual hand so we can unmute you? Madam Chair, I don't think she's present. There's someone else present, but they're not pre-registered to speak. Okay, all right. Well, then we'll uh, go ahead on the Ma consent agenda. Madam, Madam Chair. Oh, oh uh, yeah, Commissioner Eggers. I, I was thinking that somebody was gonna be calling in and they weren't, so I was gonna pull that one just to have brief discussion on it, so okay. if I could pull that one. And if, the, and if Barry has any updates on uh, number eight, which was the, the Cigna audit, any additional information? Fine, if not. Um, I, I don't have us. any additional information other than what I provided last okay. Thursday. All right, then I'll just pull number 19. Okay, so we're gonna pull number 19. Um, can we get a motion on the other agendas, uh, the other consent items? Uh, second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Um, should we continue with uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? So I just got a text that it is showing up on the TV screen at home, but not on our screen. So, on our screen, okay. So we've got a little technical issue. It is working though, so. What card is showing up there? I, I don't know the answer. I just got a text from uh, Commissioner Justice saying. <laughs> okay, so, um, but we're gonna keep going with the voice votes Yeah, we then. can just, we'll, we'll work out that. Okay, know, so, so. Um, number 19, Barry. <clears throat> Yeah. Okay. Item number 19 is just a um, plat of a state um, with um, a private residential you know, subdivision. Um, it's uh, being subdivided in seven single family lots. Uh, Kevin Gander is here. Um, he's available to answer any questions. I don't know what the question was. In yeah. So, of, so we got a public, so. we've gotten a couple of calls from uh, a couple of residents that live there and concerned about two things. One, notification of the information that's being submitted this morning for approval and whether the neighborhoods in Eniswood got um, any of the notification. Secondly, the question was, and I thought I'd just let somebody that probably could explain it better than I could, explain what this, what this motion or what this uh, decision does, what this decision allows a developer to do once we've platted um, additional subdivision and this is a subdivision that's in place so there's additional land obviously nearby that's just a little background and explanation would be helpful thank you madam chair um, thank you Barry have we got he wants to give Kevin's us a on little his way up I think he's wanting to look and read what's on the agenda uh, so okay thanks good to, good to have to. you here <laughs> good morning madam chair commissioners Kevin McAndrew BDRS director um, as stated, this is a, um, a, a seven-lot subdivision. Um, the improvements on this subdivision, as far as the roadway, sidewalks, uh, will be privately owned and maintained. Um, there are two tracks um, within the subdivision. One is a retention area. The second one, as I mentioned, is the private right-of-way and sidewalk improvements. What the, what the approval of this plat does is allow the plat to be filed, uh, which in turn would allow then the individual lots to be sold and, cl and closed on, um, and each of these lots to be moved forward as far as a single family home and, and accessory improvements being built out. Uh, Kevin, on that, just don't, are these individual lots within the subdivision or is it a, a, some land that's been added to to part of the subdivision. I can't these are remember. these are these are seven individual lots. single family lots that are already within the subdivision. Yes, that are part that are that have been created within this overall parcel. Okay. So the question and concerns about what those effects might 
do on the neighborhood are minimal as far as the number of lots that are already there, number one, and number two, the few lots that would be added, not, not, not a big deal. So for clarification purposes, the, the plat doesn't move forward until um, a development like this goes through a full site plan approval. So this, this project has already gone through, vetted out through site plan approval, engineering, environmental, um, and it's only when that site plan approval is in place that the plat can then move forward to this board. Thank you. Appreciate the explanation. Any other comments or questions? Move approval. Okay. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Um, no, if you have comments or questions, they need to be done during public comment, and you would have needed to fill out a card. Okay, so um, we're on to the regular agenda. Barry? Yep, item 23. This is a participant amendment uh, with Bank of America. This is for our electronic payment provider at 25 point of sale locations where people may use their credit card. Move approval. I've got a motion and a second. Any discussion? No. All in favor? Say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimous. Number 24. Ranking of firms with Wanamaker Jensen Architects. This is for the design services for the Palm Har Harbor Community uh, Agency Recreation Center project. So this is the, con the design consultant, $1.2 million. Overall project cost, approximately $11 million. Commissioner Edgar has a question. Um, yeah, just if somebody, excuse me, is this all right? Good morning. I guess it is. Excuse me. Mm. Um, somebody could just maybe give an update on the time frame. My understanding with this yeah. was really coming back to us in March or April, May time frame of last year. So I just wanted to get some clarification on where we are, not only with the timing for this work, but are we now on schedule to move forward once this is done to to bidding and that you know, for the contracting? Yeah, this will uh, this will kick off our design team to uh, work with Palm Harbor and get that uh, project designed. Um, we're looking to hopefully kick off construction towards the end of this year, um, and you know per their contract, they're they're contracted for two years and that includes construction administration. Delays. Um, delays in the past have been just working through the contract itself. Um, there was some confusion about whether we could split the project into programming and then the rest of design. And so we went through that process, found out we could not. So then we bundled the entire design services together into this contract. Okay, so right now we're ready to, to move forward. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Scott. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And um, the source of funding for this is 100% this penny, penny funding? Penny for Pinellas. Thank you. Any this other? was this was on that original 2017 list. Got it. Got Any it. other discussion? Yeah. And it was it, you know, on top of that. It was, uh, I think, originally on the last penny cycle, and because of financial issues, it came up during the penny. That was it was removed, and then when we went to 2017 to the residents, we told them, again, that's that's a, a priority for the next the next, next cycle. cycle. And do we have a motion? Move oh, approval. Yeah, no, second. Okay, we have a motion by Commissioner Scott, a second by Commissioner Eggers. Uh, all in favor? Say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Motion passes unanimously. Number 25. This is NMSTU for Tierra Verde Community Association for uh, tennis and pickleball court improvements, $11,500. Any? Second. Any discussion? Any discussion? So we had a motion by Commissioner Flowers, a second by Commissioner Long. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Uh, motion uh, passes unanimously. Number 26. This is two applications for funding under the Penny for Pinellas Employment Sites Program. Uh, one's for Mastery Brewing Company in Pinellas Park, and one for Ameritech um, to, um, for wastewater improvements um, and security fencing, along with their fire suppression system improvements. Yeah, I have a, um, a comment card for this item, Matthew Dunham. If you want to come up, you uh, state your name and your address, and you will have three minutes.
My name is Matthew Dom. Address is 2844 67th Way North, St. Petersburg, Florida. I am the CEO and founder of Mastery's Brewing Co. <laughs> so first of all, I want to uh, take a moment to thank uh, Pinellas County Economic Development and the SBDC for all their efforts with us to um, bring us to um, really, again, helping to clarify and find ways for us to make this project successful um, despite the financial gaps that we've we've. Uh, uh, have seen since, uh, again, the changes of 2019 and bringing this project to fruition. So to start with, Mastery's Brewing Co. Um, has come leaps and bounds since its first inception in 2014, but the key aspect of everything that we participate, which, again, is why the craft beer culture has become such a uh, beloved entity into the different communities that we participate. And I feel quite confident that I can say throughout Pinellas County from the city of St. Pete Beach where we are all the way up to Dunedin, Tarpon Springs, city of St. Petersburg, everybody has found that their craft beer uh, or craft brewery has become a real heart and staple uh, in the community that invests so much, not into just jobs, um, but into the philanthropic work and, and as well as tourism into their community. So with this expansion, this allows Mastery's Brewing Co. to more than triple its operations as well as expand its operations into new product segments that we are not currently able to, um, basically able to manufacture. With that, it's going to bring countless new jobs with this new facility we're estimating we're actually able to put over 100 people to work on it. Um, we're talking about a full-on fledged beverage manufacturing entity that, um, again, um, with my visit recently to the manufacturing summit put on by PCED and the City of Pinellas Park, we've been able to see that manufacturing leads Florida in the economics for providing more than sustainable incomes for families. So right now leading 10 to 15 percent higher percent of income for individuals. So with this, of course, manufacturing requires equipment, costly equipment. Everything is medical grade stainless, putting in large infrastructure for everything from water to gas to sewer to making vast you know, um, investments into our infrastructures to support that. With that being said, we pay state taxes, we pay federal taxes, we pay manufacturing taxes, we pay sales taxes. So we are a economic engine that becomes a love of work, play, and into the community that allows us to be something different that creates a culture for a community and its people, its workers, um, and everybody who partakes in and sees it to be proud of and um, more than welcoming it and really, again, uh, becomes a, I, I can't go back to anything more than saying a, an overall economic uh, engine that is both about the love of what you do in your community and partaking in your community. So what we are asking, and again, since, um, as mentioned, working with the city of Pinellas Park, and we've been working on this project since 2019, and as we've seen, the economic ways have drastically changed. Our, our budget has just now exceeded because of those, those costs. And what we want to do is make sure that we don't miss any step in executing 100% of what we said we're bringing and putting as many people to work as we possibly can, while also bringing in new opportunity for growth, economics, business in the city of Pinellas Park that will really lead the way for future generations to come. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other discussion on item 26? Uh, Commissioner Scott. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, on the uh, Ameritech uh, request, I didn't, Thank see you. An, I didn't see an ESP score on that one, Do, unless, I, unless I missed it. But I Teresa, didn't, didn't Teresa's see coming up. The uh, attachment of the one pager, it should give you that at the very top. I um, didn't I didn't see it. Maybe I missed it, but yeah, I'm sorry. I'm trying to find it myself real quick. Uh, the uh, CEO of Ameritex here as well, just if you wanted to say hello, he uh, actually is relocating his business from California to Dunedin. Like so it's yeah, pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Find it, find it, find it. Oh, you're right, it's not on there, and I do apologize. Um, going back from memory, they did very well. Um, they were at a 92. 92. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. And if I'm not correct with that, I will follow up, but I'm pretty sure it was a 92. I appreciate that. And just for, for you know, residents that may be watching here, 
you know, as we're providing tax dollars to business for economic development and business expansion, can you just talk about, you know, how we hold those companies accountable to make sure that they follow through with the things that they say that they're going to do? Absolutely. Love to be able to talk about that because it's my tax dollars too. So uh, with this program, uh, we're, we're really keen on making sure that we have templated agreements that we work on um, every time somebody's come through the process. We do a, somewhat of a financial gap certification during application where we make sure that the dollars being requested are accurate. Um, following your conditional approvals on these applications, we then move forward and do a third-party due diligence piece where um, the applicants take the time and work with consultants that we have identified through various systems to uh, do a third-party due diligence offline. We don't want all of that to happen under the Sunshine Law, so that's how we did our third-party due diligence. Once that takes place, we then... Um, move forward with putting an agreement together. The agreement is one that has clawback mechanisms so that over the course of the 20-year life of the agreement terms and conditions, uh, we're able to make sure that the organizations that receive these dollars uh, continue to check that box and, and, and one, maintain the, the, the uh, building and the project the way that it was identified to us when we originally did it. Um, it's also a way to um, dispense the funds so that everybody's on the same page and we don't have any questions as we go through the process. Um, it's been very successful. So I can tell you that um, through round five, we've got, or through up to round five um, because of everything, but right now we've got somewhere in the neighborhood of about 24 million committed uh, through the first four rounds. Uh, and we've paid out. Um, over 8.5 million. So uh, we're, we're doing fairly well with the program considering it's new and unique to us. So with that, if you all have any other questions, be glad to help. Thank you very much. Um, Commissioner Flowers. Good morning, not a question, but just a um, comment or compliment to Ameritech. Um, which one is the, <laughs> hi, it's nothing negative, it's good. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> Welcome to Pinellas County, and thank you so much for moving your services uh, here, because that certainly means additional employment opportunities. Just wanted to share that I think we have some wonderful biochemical chemistry um, and technology cybersecurity programs, um, not just in our high schools where they actually receive certification and are ready to go to work, even though they may be a little young, but we have that immersion into our local colleges here um, that have some really, really great programs. So um, thank you so much for coming to our community. Um, I think you will be a wonderful addition and um, please by all means take advantage of our young people who will be graduating from college and eagerly looking for employment opportunities that fall right in line with what you're doing because we've held STEM um, as a very high category for educational training here locally. So. I'm just happy that you're here and you've, you're providing or you have the opportunity to provide some great um, uh, forward movement um, portions for our young people in our community. So thank you and welcome. And for Mr. Brewmaster, <laughs> maybe if you give some classes in brewing, we can get some people for you too. But thank you so much for the 100 plus people that you're going to. Yes, sir. Great. Fabulous, and I'm gonna throw in Pinellas Technical College that has an extensive culinary program both on their St. Pete campus and their Clearwater campus, so don't forget about them. Um, but just wanna say thank you to both of you for adding in to our community, knowing that um, we have some persons who we really wanna make sure they can afford to remain in our community, live in our community, and you're providing those opportunities. So just a moment of thank you. Any other questions or comments? Move can approval. I Okay, we got a motion by Commissioner Scott and a second by Commissioner Long. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes unanimous, number 27. The Supportable Housing Program for Bayou um, Boulevard Apartments. Uh, this provides funding not to exceed $2.8 million um, for the proposed units, 12 units um, below 50%. 
or a total of 60 units, the breakdown of the different income brackets are in your packet. Four building needs in St. Pete. I have a motion. Do I have a second? I'll second, but I have a quick question. Okay, we have a motion by Commissioner Flowers, a second by Commissioner Scott. Any other discussion? Uh, just a question on uh, the affordability time frame on this, 30, 30 years, I assume? But yeah, Bruce is on its way up. And this, this program, you know, is really possible, and, you know, we continue to struggle with the overall cost of these projects. Um, the, the subsidy necessary to meet income thresholds continues to rise. The city of St. Petersburg really stepped up because we couldn't do this on our own, um, but they've provided, you know, um, what, $2.74 million um, out of their funds in order to be able to make a project like this happen. But Bruce, go ahead. Good morning, Bruce Plessy, Housing Community Development Manager. Um, yes, this is construction funding, so we'll encumber those dollars and put a 20-year restriction in place for the affordability. Thank you. Any more discussion? Okay, we had a, we had a motion and we have a second. I'll quick, oh, quick question, Rangers. I'm sorry. I thought you were gonna say longer than 20 years, so explain to me a little bit about the time frame commitment to the affordability aspect of a project, just a little bit, and why 20 versus longer period? Sure. Um, basically, the starting point would be the guidelines. The Penny for Pinellas guidelines have a minimum requirement of 15 years if we're providing construction funding. And so then basically it becomes a negotiated duration. Um, a lot of times we end up with 30 years because there's other funding sources that have that requirement. So we'll mimic that if we're doing a land acquisition project, then with the land trust, then we encumber the land permanently because it's owned by the county and it's permanent affordability. So, you know, there's kind of some key negotiating points. The first and foremost would be the dollar amount. The second point would be how much affordability are we achieving? By that, I mean the number of affordable units as well as those incomes being served. And then the, a third key component would be the time frame. So after 20 years, what's it look like? Market rates? Um, the restriction would go away. Um, typically, before that point, usually around the 15-year period, most multifamily projects are looking to recapitalize, rehab, do something different. And so that's typically an opportunity that either through bond financing, additional assistance, um, we could extend that affordability period. Um, or, quite frankly, it could be at that point, it's a 20-year-old apartment complex and, you know, the current terminology is natural occurring affordable housing. A 20-year complex would not command the rates of a brand new apartment complex. Perhaps maybe you can um, summarize the projects that we've approved and the time frame for um, the commitment of affordability by each of those developers so that we have a sense of how each of them fit in. This doesn't seem long, but it's probably what we've been doing for some of these projects. So. Um, I do have some concerns about the term only being 20 years or only being 15 years when government agencies are providing almost $5 million, which is, what the, what's that as a percentage of the cost? Uh, 25%? Oh, cost 17 million. 16.4% yeah. of the project. How much? 16.4%. Our part. Our part, you're saying? Correct. St. Petersburg's part? Another 16%? Um, right around another 16%. A third of the cost of the project. Correct or 20-year commitment on affordable housing. Again. We can certainly summarize that. A lot of the projects, as I mentioned, do end up being 30 years. Um, those projects have a lot of additional financing, particularly from the state or, or the bond financing. This project is really what I would consider a, a market rate project that now will be including affordable units because of the city and the county's investment. Um, otherwise, this would probably be a market rate project coming out, but instead it's going to be 100% workforce, as well as having two other tiers of affordability. All right, if you could bring that summary to us at a future time. Certainly. Just send us, you don't have to bring it back here, but just send us the information. That would be helpful. Certainly. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Flowers? Um, do you know if the city of St. Pete's uh, term agreement as it relates to number of years, it remains affordable? runs concurrent with ours or are extended because because typically the city of st pete has a longer endurance on their requirement i would need to verify that for certain yeah i, I just wanted to share that typically st pete has a longer endurance and i know that that's why you guys have probably heard me talk about and even ask here publicly at some of the meetings 
um, about setting certain recommendations or standards, especially if they're using our money to purchase the land so that it remains affordable for a longer period of time. Some years ago, we've had some, not here in the county, but um, in St. Pete, they've had some with a 99 year lease so that it, at least you know it runs that period of time for affordability. Um, and then there are also some standards or um, uh, bullets within the contract that says you'll go back and revisit the terms of the lease to assure, to try to assure some affordability. And then when they're using funds from the state of Florida, from the Florida Housing Coalition and other places, or if they're getting um, assistance from other sources, they also layer on lengths of terms for uh, longevity. But you bring up a very good point yeah. because you know, in 20 years or so, if they decide to make this market rate, then what happens to the people that are living there that have been able to afford yeah. it because of the 80, uh, 60, and 120 AMI? So you yeah. do bring up a very valid and good point. Well, yeah, and so to your point, thank you, Commissioner Flowers, then perhaps at each of these deals, there is another overriding organizational requirement for a longer period of time. And how does that affect any of it? So if there's one piece of it, that has a 30-year component or a 40-year component, and ours is 20, how does that affect the affordability piece of that property? Does it go to 40 years? Because that's one of the components of the, con of the financing package is longer? Um, not necessarily. In other words, those requirements can overlap. If you had these 60 units, for example, and St. Petersburg was requiring 30 years for 20 of those units, and the county was requiring 20 years for 10 of those units, so they're separate and could expire at different times. Now, with most projects that are state of Florida financed, those end up being 100% affordable, 50-year affordability, which you know sounds really good, but apartments don't last 50 years without renovation, rehab, and those kind of things. So there is usually, during that time period, and, and same thing with the land trust program, when we secure the land for permanent affordability, you know that locks up some requirements, but that doesn't mean that those units won't need renovation, additional dollars, and, and those kind of things. So to your point, the, the different funding sources have their own requirements. Those often overlap. A unit might be meeting the requirement of a 50% AMI and a 60% AMI for two different funding sources. One could have expired at a different time. So basically what the management company has to do is make sure they're meeting all the most stringent restrictions. Okay, well, going forward, then I think maybe need a little bit more clarification on that and how those different organizations affect the number of units that are available and how the overall project looks. Because, again, if it's 50, 20 years, it just doesn't seem enough. But if to St. Petersburg is doing 30 years or longer, and I think we need to know that information in this meeting. Going Again, we you know we rely on the the guidelines. In this case, the penny per penals has the funding source. Those guidelines are what we look to as the minimum. We typically try to get more than that. And in this case, we have negotiated five additional years. We could look at longer if that's the board's wishes. Um, the ship program that requires 15 years. Home program 20 years. So it, it all kind of goes back to the the funding source that we're utilizing for the project. Thank you. Any other discussion? Okay, I believe we had a motion and a second. So all in favor, aye. aye. Any opposed? Okay, motion passes unanimously. We're on to number 28. 28 is an award of bid to Hubbard Construction Company um, for the uh, 2024 pavement preservation package number two. Um, the breakdown of the uh, different projects that are being proposed under this are listed within your packet. There's also maps provided in case residents want to look and see, you know, where their particular road is. Kelly, it's it's part of the attachment, yes? Mm -hmm. Well, if they look up the item. Um, so the question, the question is how do residents know? <laughs> I can't answer that. <laughs> yeah, I, I understand, I, my understanding is the maps are attached. Uh, Kelly Hammer-Levy, Public Works Director. You can just go to Pinellas.gov and type in resurfacing in the search box, and the whole page will pop up with the schedules, the map, all, everything you'd want to know about our road resurfacing program. But the maps are... The maps should... There should be a map attached to the agenda item for package two, yeah. Just specific to package two.
But the Some people year, are searching. Is there any discussion searching, while they're looking? I hope it's there. I, do. <laughs> I know we had it. The, um, uh, the whole year's worth of programming is on the map online. So it isn't just this package. We have a third, we'll have a third package coming. Okay. Any discussion or questions? Do we have a motion? Are we not ready? We've got a move uh, approval from second. Commissioner Long, a second by Commissioner Flowers. Any other discussion or questions? A, Commissioner Scott. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm, I have some notes here when I was doing my agenda review about carry forward funding uh, in Penny and Transportation Millage, but I don't see that. It must have been in the, one of the attachments. Um, okay. I, was, I, I don't know. I was just wondering if the, if the carry forward funding uh, was already allocated to, to future projects. But I well, can't, we, I can't seem carry to find that in the well, notes, it, it, if, Whether it's Penny for Pinellas or it is the Transportation Trust Fund, mm -hmm. uh, they both carry forward into those programs. Okay. And so if we're going to do programs regardless of the year, you know, if we have to carry it forward, it's still accomplishing the same thing. Have we already done a resolution to carry that forward? I guess? It, it, well, we did one, and we may be doing another it's next, uh, next at the next meeting. Okay. Okay. All right. Thanks. So, so Kelly, I don't, I don't see the maps on here. I'm sure they're in here someplace, but I just don't see them. And um, so, f and and do the the site that you're talking about also give the estimated period of time when each of these projects are going to be done? Is that so that folks can understand what why don't it's why don't we send out a link to that to commissioners yeah. so where you can see all the different packages? Um, okay. She's saying that it does have a time period for the when when the, okay. all the pro, um, road projects are prepared. And again, you're going to have another package coming up, package three that'll be added to that list. You already and so this is the second one. There's also okay. a third one. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimous. We're on to number 29. Item number 29 is the long-awaited um, Grand Canal maintenance <laughs> dredge project, um, and this is being awarded to uh, Gator Dredging. Um, again, this is um, being paid for under federal funds, um, which makes this eligible, um, and it's the way we were able to accomplish this $1.39 million. Move approval. We got a motion by Commissioner Scott, a second by Commissioner Long, and thank goodness this is finally coming here. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Passes unanimously. I'm sure the people in Tierra Verde will be very happy. <laughs> on to watch. number 30. <laughs> I'm 30. Uh, this is amendment number two uh, with the Florida Department of Transportation for the way in which we establish current conditions for traffic maintenance and compensation. Okay. Any discussion or questions? Move no? approval. Second. And a motion by Commissioner Sock. Scott, second by Commissioner Flowers. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? The motion passes unanimously. We are on to number 31. It's a grant agreement with the Tampa Bay Estuary um, Program for Joe's Creek Restoration Phase 2. This provides $454,000 uh, as passed through to do uh, infrastructure. There's no county match required. Second. We have a motion from Commissioner Flowers, second by Commissioner Scott. Any other discussion? Seeing none, um, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously, number 32. This resolution application is to receive emergency medical services trust fund monies for pre-hospital emergency medical services. So these are state of Florida funds that are annually dispersed. Um, we had a package that was submitted, um, and a, the award of $140,000 will be used for a pilot program for a consultant for the 911 opioid overdose response addiction specialist, an EMS professional education, EMS public outreach, and a rehabilitation unit vehicle to support our EMS rehabilitation operations. There's no match funds required with this grant. Okay. I've got a motion from Commissioner Long. Second from Commissioner Flowers. Any other discussion or questions? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimous. Number 33. This resolution provides a one-time grace period uh, for applying for meet, uh, the metered water claim rates, as you approved previously or um, uh, supported. Uh, we're bringing it back to provide a four-month grace. 
Commissioner Eggers asked a question last Thursday. Jeremy has a quick slide to show you how it will show up on the bill. Um, so we can uh, talk through that. Good morning. Jeremy Wall Utilities. So there's a lot of information on these slides. I don't intend that you need to digest all of that. Uh, but I did want to show you quickly, this is what the portal looks like today on the left side. There is currently no reclaimed data available to customers. On the right side as of today, um, actually about last week, um, this is what customers can go into the portal online and see active usage of the reclaimed data so they can see a monthly breakdown of um, their usage. And those are for the customers that have installed reclaimed meters. There's a 2,000-ish, 1,900 that are uh, in the, nope, 6,000, sorry, 6,000 reclaimed meters in the ground today of our 15,000 reclaimed customers. So 6,000 of our customers can go to the, see this uh, live data today. What the new bills will look like, both online portal and the hard copy bills that get mailed. On the left side, you see what has historically been billed. Uh, you see in the bottom, the blue is, shows their water consumption, and you'll see on the left side a line for reclaimed water at $60 flat rate. Uh, for the specific trial customer, example customer. And that's a two month um, billing period, so $30 per month, $60. On the right hand side, you'll see what the new bill will look like during the grace period. So you see the purple line in the graph represents the reclaimed consumption next to the water consumption. And you'll see in the blue box, we actually quantify in a table the actual gallons used through that meter um, in the bill. So we're trying to make it as apparent as possible. So here's your water usage and consumption. Here's your reclaimed usage and consumption. And the difference between the left and the right is it used to be um, just flat rate build, and now you're actually showing the consumption. During the grace period, you will see that we will show a flat rate, $30 per month for the bi-monthly. Uh, on the left-hand side, we still show the table with the 40 gallons, or 40,000 gallons as an example. And then on the right-hand side is a user that went over the 20,000 gallons per month. So you see 50,000 gallons on a two-month period. You still will see a reclaimed rate at $60, so they're still being charged the flat rate during the grace period. But we are demonstrating that they have, their consumption is over the limit. So you can see and track during this grace period, hey, this is what I'm actually using. It will impact me, um, but my charge, my actual bill, will still be at the flat rate bill during the grace period. Yes? Correct. We are still on, on two month. We bill every two months until all the meters get installed, and then we'll transition to a monthly billing. But we can't do some customers on monthly and some customers on two months. And then lastly, this is an example on the right. Uh, this is uh, still under the grace period. You see a customer who is over the, um, the base rate of 20,000 gallons a month, so 40,000 for two months. Um, still billed at the $60 for two months during the grace period. And then on the right-hand side of the graph will be what they will be after the grace period. We show um, the consumption over the limit. And we also show where the billing appears, how much you got billed for the extra water over the limit. So in the um, <coughs> reclaimed water greater than $40,000, $16.90 is the extra money that was uh, being billed for being over the 20,000 gallons per month limit approved in the rate structures. Okay, is that, are you done? Yes. Okay, Commissioner Long has a question. <laughs> Microphone. Sorry. I'm assuming, I don't know if I'm right or wrong, that we're letting our customers know about this uh, grace period that's still open by a little note that's in their bill? Yes, I actually have a, Isaiah Jackson, who's our customer service division director. He can give you lots of detail, but we've been notifying customers before the new rate structure, with the new rate structures, and on uh, with the hard copy bill mailers and, and we call them on certs of titles across bills. Um, 
And if I could just ask a follow up. Yeah, do you wanna hear that? Morning, Isaiah Jackson, Business and Customs Services Division Director. Yes, that is correct, Commissioners. We've been notifying customers as of 2023, both website, both online, um, through messaging, all avenues that you have out there. So the customers are aware of this. Thank you. Yeah. And my follow-up question is, are you getting any negative responses from the notices that people are getting? We're not getting negative responses. We're getting questions about the process, questions about the reclaim billing, what the impact will be, and we're responding to those. Excellent. Yeah. So if I could just, mm -hmm. Jeremy, can you let us know please, if in the future you start getting complaints from our citizens? Yeah, we do expect feedback. So uh, we just ran a report this morning. So of the 6,000 meters that we have installed that we've been able to go and review data, about 2,000 of them are over the 20,000 gallons per month. So we know we're in drought <laughs> conditions right now, and so people are watering more in their lawns, but this will impact those customers. So we do expect feedback. That's why this data is important so people can see their usage. And that's why this grace period is important for people to see that they're going to be over and not just get surprised one day with a, with a really high bill. Thank you. And Commissioner Scott? I'm sorry. No, I have another one. Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so, Jeremy, if, if I'm a customer, I, can I log in real time if I have a meter and see if it's the 16th of the month and I want to see what my usage has been up, you know, real time? Uh, real time, I won't say like up to the minute, but. Right, but pretty close. <laughs> You won't see up to the minute, but you can log in. The, the information in the website is real time up to date. However, there's certain timestamps that goes with it. It's when we put the meters inside, so they, we do a ping, approximately eight pings a day with that AMI meter, okay. uh, 0.8 milliseconds. So you'll be able to see the data within like a 15 minute timeline. This is for both reclaim and potable. So this is all AMI meters. That's the whole purpose of this project. But certainly within but, a day? But certainly within a day. So you yes. should be able to see yesterday's, you know, right. a day or two grace period. But. That's great. Now, the feedback that I've been, been getting um, from some residents is that they think the reclaimed water is just too expensive, and some are considering just cutting that off and not having it anymore. But so if they decide to do that, they're still going to get charged an availability fee, correct? Yes. For, for the areas, um, we have two different areas. Go ahead and explain the, the... Yeah, yeah, we do. We have funded and unfunded, so there are going to be availability fees versus service fees. However, with the reclaim, what we're educating the customers with is that with the consumption, it's when you go over the allowance, which is 20,000 gallons monthly or 40,000 bi-monthly, we char we're charging $1.69 per 1,000 gallons. So it's to help educate these customers as far as the usage itself. We do have a process that if they disconnect from reclaim, um, they can, there will be some non-charges that goes with that. However, it's based on how they're served, whether they're in a funded area, which means that the developer or their private owner paid for their reclaim, or unfunded, which means we paid for it, so we're expecting them to pay it back over a 30-year period. Okay, got it. Commissioner Eggers. Thank you. Um, yeah, so you said something just then about being paid back over a 30-year period. And again, this... Maybe what we need to do is, for, for, for my benefit, but maybe for others too, to have a reclaim discussion at a workshop again, to kind of talk about where we are, where the system is. You said payback in 30 years, so that unfunded piece that people are paying and not having access to the water goes away after 30 years? Correct, after the, the, pay, the, the service fees retire after the 30 years from when they, the infrastructure was installed. And we, and we have it. Yeah. They actually do. Commissioner have access to the water. If they choose not to use it, they're still obligated to pay that fee. Understand. But, but after 30 years for that house, yes. that goes away. That Correct. Goes away. Okay. So we, our system is tracking that. Yeah, we have a, we, and that's built into our rate models. It's interesting the first 5,000 or 6,000 that you put in, how much over each are based on what we've been told by scientists that people need. So, you know, we've had a shortfall of projects. We've had to shut off the water at eight, or reclaimed at eight o'clock in the morning. We've had to do a lot of things. And I think maybe circling back and talking about how this system has progressed over the years, because people have been available, have gotten into this under one set of rules, 
gotten a second set of rules and now maybe a third set of rules. So I think it would be good to revisit the whole, the whole project and kind of where we're at and what we're finding already and what the significance of that is. Because really, I mean, if you go to most communities and, uh, and I live in Dunedin, you have 15 to 20,000 gallons is plenty. If you're going over that, we're, get, we're, hitting pretty, we're getting hit pretty hard in Dunedin if you go over that. But if you stay under it, it's like so cheap. And maybe that's something that we need to talk about as well. But yeah, we, we can come back and get, do a total overview. I'd, I'd like that. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions or discussion? Uh, we have a public comment from David Ballard Geddes, Jr. David, if you want to come up, you have three minutes. Mm -hmm. Hi, thank you, Madam Chair. David Ballard Geddes, Jr. I live on 802 Georgia Avenue in Palm Harbor. Florida Supreme Court case 96332 ratifying the reclaimed water bonds. In that case, it states that with this availability fee that we have unlimited use for reclaimed water. In fact, Joe Morrissey, County Attorney Joe Morrissey, was on that court case. I do believe that uh, that court case needs to be revisited um, should you be changing the uh, rules uh, uh, with metering reclaimed water um, and uh, that uh, this um, now availability fee plus you have to pay the addition of a metered charge. I feel as though us, the residents, are getting set up Back in the 1970s, when the developers came through here, unbridled development took place, equipping every home with a sprinkler system, deliberately, legislatively aggregating the water supply so that they could contrive and invoke such invocation as this reclaimed water occupation, pulling a variance on the residents claiming eminent domain rights based on House Bill 639, reclaimed water is intended to be soldiered inside of our homes for laundry and toilet use so they can replumb our homes and levy into the equity of our homes to pay for that kind of contrivance. I think we have a, a, a setup going on here. We have to pay for a backflow charge on our water bill as well. Yet Senate Bill 64 says that they want to add reclaimed water directly to the potable water supply. They're injecting reclaimed water directly into the aquifer um, over in a uh, 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 river view area and then pumping it. The we need to sit down and talk about this issue here. Uh, we can go about things a little bit differently. We seem to have a lot of hedge fund operations taking place, no conservation taking place, completely mismanaged use of water supply based on the 14th Amendment. We have issues. Thank you. Thank you, David. Any more discussion? Move approval. Got a motion to approve from Commissioner Second. Scott. Second. Second from Commissioner Long. Um, Dave, was that a, a motion or a, I'm I have good. a question? I'm good. Okay. Um, all, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimous. Go on to number 34. Number 34, we're asking for ratification of the initiation of litigation in the case referenced in your agenda. It was a petition for an emergency temporary injunction to prevent illicit discharge of sewerage. Uh, we're also seeking a follow-up permanent injunction. The defendant had agreed to entry of the emergency injunction, so uh, we're looking to see if compliance comes before we see what further steps are needed. Do you have any questions or discussion? Move approval. M motion by Commissioner Eggers. I, I just wanted to ask. Commissioner Long has a uh, question. John, do you, I know it says um, the case number, but where in the county is this going on? I believe it's in Pinellas Park. How um, long has have, it been going on? Uh, it was discovered in November, uh, end of November, and we took steps uh, as soon as it was brought to us. Um, I believe there was a, uh, and this is from memory, this is not all here, but uh, I believe there was an RV on the property that had discharges coming from it going into a uh, retention pond, and then that in turn popped off uh, into 
a water body when that was discovered we sought the emergency injunction with the, the chairs approval to move forward uh, the defendant agreed to the entry of the temporary injunction to stop all every activities that were in violation and uh, that's what I know at this point if there anything further I'd have to get further information myself so are we monitoring it to ensure that they did uh, yes, that's what that's we're, we're ensuring compliance at this point and to the extent that they were to violate the temporary injunction they'd be in violation of a court order we'd be seeking uh, the power of the court to enforce their order to do that. All right, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Okay, we have a motion from Commissioner Eggers, second from Commissioner Scott. Any further discussion? Seeing done, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimous. Do you have any reports from the county attorney? Just that you should have received the uh, updated uh, quarterly litigation report and uh, by email. If you have any questions about that, please reach out. And we're on to number 36, county administrator. Um, yes, Commissioner. So you asked for a update on all of the beach nourishment um, projects uh, or efforts that are currently ongoing. So I'm gonna provide a brief summary. Um, we also have Kelly Levy and Joe Silverboard here that can provide any follow-up detail that you or in questions you may have. <clears throat> so as you know, this has been going on, you know, for an ex a long period of time. The Assistant Secretary of the Army for the Corps of Engineers, is his name is Connor. So ACA Connor, he met with Senator Scott and Senator Rubio and at our chair's um, request. And and they've they've really kind of deferred uh, the Army Corps to to the WERDA report. So the WERDA report is going to be coming out later this month. Um, they're waiting on that. The word is a is a bill that would we could add language to that would compel the core to recognize um, uh, and and modify these procedures. So the procedures that they've taken, uh, which is the change from what they've done for the past 30 years or longer, um, was really an interpretation issue within the core. So the word the word of language could compel compliance with what we're requesting. In essence. To incorporate past practice um, but again that we're waiting on the word of report that's going to be due out uh, later this month the core may in fact oppose that but th that's that's been the discussions with um, Senator Rubio and Scott in other words the core hasn't um, modified their procedures or acknowledged to go back and change their procedures pending the outcome of the and the entire word of language um, at the same time, Congressman Luna addressed the House Transportation Infrastructure Committee this past Thursday and entered concerns on the Corps' easement policies and the need for the WERDA amendments. <clears throat> Staff continues to talk with Jacksonville and Corps of Engineers District Office. They met last week uh, on finalizing the Sunset Beach, Pro Beach Project that predates the state's erosion control line. So here they're trying to prepare a request to the South Atlanta Division for their review that would provide for the historic easements of the deeded properties uh, to the Corps of Engineers by the state of Florida for all beach access. The next meeting on that is January the 29th. District staff reiterates the permanent easements um, are still being required. Um, uh, Florida Representative Lindy, Lindsey Cross introduced a House um, memorial uh, seeking congressional support to modify the word of language also. Our consultant has been working on a long-term approach to create options and risks should we have uh, procurement easements. We're also looking at all the options available and we've talked about those. Um, they, and, and it's complicated, you know, um, including, you know, where, wh whether we should um, use any type of authority that we have uh, to compel um, property that is necessary for those. But it's really the word of language and, and a modification of that is what we need. Um, we finalized the scope for work for the full nourishments on our own. We have a permit a permitting meeting with the regulatory agencies in early February. So we're not stopping. We'd still need to design. We'd still need to go through the entire permitting process. We're doing that on our own to where if when we can resolve this, we're ready to go. Um, so we're mit submitting the state appropriation request that's due Friday for Hurricane um, Idalia damages. 
Beach Nursing is eligible for up to 50% funding, but the state uh, only appropriated 50 million, um, and our project estimate is 80 million. Uh, Florida Shores and Beaches Association is preparing a request for state appropriation bills that would grandfather all, all local funding from the $50 million repair, repair and recovery program. If uh, requested, we would certainly support that. Um, the original dune restoration project continues in Indian Shores. We're working on a plan to regrade the emergency <laughs> dune damage during the December storm. So there's areas where it decimated the dunes, there's areas where we can smooth it out, but we still have some level of protection. It, you know, it did its job, but it, it, it hadn't seeded. So there's uh, different levels of uh, damages that have occurred. Um, Commissioner Peters request for a work session on Grand Canal. We're incorporating this. The, the core determined Grand Canal does not meet a requirement for a federal designation. However, if we can get the core to place sand from Basin A, which now is full of seagrass, and the channel entrance to Paso Grill, um, then again, that would be a long-term maintenance issue. So we're going to continue to work with them, but we're trying to pull all these programs kind of in together. Um, again, we can revisit all these in the future, but hopefully we can make progress on the word of language. Um, we haven't been able to get the Corps to modify their, um, th their policies at this point. We have a consultant um, that is working locally for us to bring all the Florida counties together that is on FAC's agenda, um, and FAC has taken that to NACO, and I know, Commissioner, you're going to be going to NACO here. Um, w w this is a national issue. It hits us hard because not too many places have 35 miles of beaches um, and, and, and ones where we construct. A lot of them, you know, you have a beach here and you have a beach here and, you know, boulders in between. Um, and, um, but it, it hits us hard. Some of the others are just now seeing the impacts of that because their nourishment cycle is coming up. Um, and so we've had a hard time pulling people together because, frankly, they don't want to sign on if their project's moving okay and they don't want to make someone mad. Um, but we're continuing to work all these avenues um, the best we can. Um, again, I think the word of report that's due at the end of this month is going to be key in how we move forward. Uh, we're continuing to look for options and alternatives, and we'll keep you apprised as we make progress or we have more information on each and every one of the bullets that I just covered. So those of us that are going to NACO, um, do you need or want us to visit folks? Um, Ginger called and said that they're they're going to have that issue. Um, so I, I, yeah, I don't. I have to. I'd have to get with Ginger on it. I mean, she okay. she's. They've obviously taken that. Um, I don't know where it stands, and you would know better in terms of NACO's legislative process, um, or whether they can impact that. Uh, the question is, is it does it rise to the level of becoming a, a national issue under NACO's platform? And and I just don't know the answer to that. But okay. Ginger, I know, is all over it. She's she she it. reached out to me the other day to ask if I was going to be there, and that was the, the reason why. So Let's have a conversation offline. I, if we can get support, okay. we, we absolutely want to push this. This is a national issue. There are going to be beaches, you know, over in the Panhandle. There's going to be beaches on the Atlantic coast. There's going to be, be beaches all over the United States um, that will be impacted by this change in core policy. Um, so certainly if, if, um, if we can make that a NACO priority, um, that okay. would be terrific. And the key is going to be getting behind <laughs> language and the word of bill because absent that, pressure certainly has not moved the core. Okay. Kathleen. Commissioner Long. Um, well, I also uh, feel very strongly mm -hmm. that there's strength in, in numbers and this is a big issue, not only for our county, but for our state. And some of us have had the, I was going to say luxury, but it's not real privilege, of actually having served with some folks that are now members of Congress. And so I don't think it would be a bad idea if, because Ginger reached out to me as well, uh, for us to lend our voices to those folks eyeball to eyeball because I think there's some real positive things that could come out of that. What do you think? I, I, I agree. Um, and Commissioner, our, our Senator Scott's office uh, communicates with me whenever there's any kind of progress. So um, I, I, I've been a big advocate of somebody who has relationships that we all, if we all have relationships, that we use them. 
So um, absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, Commission, are you? Are, did you have any more comments? Well, no. But like you, I have had conversations with Senator Rubio's office because we served together, and um, I don't know. I mean, I just think if there's a direction that we know we want to go in and we want to change hearts and minds, well, then we have to do our part too. I agree. Okay. And, and just as a follow-up on that, Commissioner, I 100% I agree any and all communication is helpful and positive. Um, the meeting between Senator Scott and Senator Rubio, I thought would help the core. Yeah. You know, it would give them an opportunity to mend their um, interpretations. Um, and they haven't done that. But who, who met with them? Senator Rubio and Senator Scott. Yeah, they did. With right, but who met with Rubio and Scott? Is uh, Assistant Secretary of the Army, yeah. Connor, who yeah. is... I'm talking about from here. Oh, we weren't part of that meeting, but they, well, they met with them, to, with the Assistant Secretary directly. <laughs> we tried to get them here to where we, we could. We offered to go to Washington, D.C., and they wanted to meet with them, just those three. Um, but. And, and they understand the issue. Yeah, the they're course, very proficient on the issue. They, the they've core talked is just, to us. They're, they're, they've got their heels dug in the sand, literally. Yeah. Okay, so you yeah. Okay, I got Commissioner Scott. Did, no? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so when we dredge Grand Canal, what are we going to do with that sand? Because I thought the Army Corps said that wasn't suitable for anything else. So what are we going to do with it? Well, he's going to dump it on some beach somewhere. I don't know. I'm going to ask <laughs> her as she comes up. To use over and over again, <laughs> and then they took it away from us. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but in somebody's backyard, or right? <laughs> it will be placed on Paso Girl Beach, south of the snack shack. Okay. All right. Good. But Thank in you. the future, we can't do that, correct? When we maintain it. It, we can. It's it's and it's approved sand source. Um, we went through the federal NEPA process to get that sand approved um, as a federal sand source. That was how we were trying to connect this project to the Paso Grill nourishment. Um, when we thought that project was going forward, we asked the Corps to include that uh, Basin A and the Grand Canal as a alternate sand source that the contractor could use. When uh, Basin A became, uh, when seagrass started encroaching in that area and we can no longer use it, they said that the canal itself was insufficient and didn't have enough sand to make it co the cost benefit worthwhile. But it still has gone through that process. So if something were to change, um, you know, we've already laid the groundwork for that. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay. So no questions, discussions? Barry, you got anything else? Uh, that concludes my um, just uh, very positive uh, report. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, the, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna continue to all, the, all these efforts. And, and so, you know, we're not, we're not stopping. It's just very frustrating. And I know it's frustrating for you and I know it's frustrating for our residents. Um, as I've said, as, as we make progress, um, as we come up with options, at some point we're going to get to, um, we're, we're going to have a set of options. Um, and I think it's very important that we, and I've talked to the chair about this, um, do a great job of communicating with our residents, having these frank conversations. None of these options, unless we get the word of language, um, you know, is, are easy or positive, but um, literally holding public meetings and, and making sure everybody has a chance to ask any of the questions. and and we have a very open and transparent process as we go forward on this. So as we get there, we want to do that. I just want to assure the residents that as we have options, that we would talk with them and, 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 and get everybody's input and as we, as we move forward on decisions. Okay. All right. So we'll move on to um, number 37, the reappointment um, of Dr. Jennifer Pearson as one of the four hospital administrators. Um, any comments, discussion, motion, motion from Commissioner Eggers, second from Commissioner Flowers. Seeing no other discussion, um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Um, we can go on to uh, county new business. Uh, Commissioner Eggers. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just a few things. Um, first of all, Happy New Year to everybody. Um, first time we've gotten back together besides the workshop last week, but um, to our residents. Uh, also, a brief congratulations to Chris and Bianca Latvala for their wedding this past Saturday. Um, awesome event, uh, beautiful, beautiful ceremony, and wishing them much happiness and success. Um, the Crosswinds Bridge item was brought up, and I know that uh, it's been extremely frustrating for the residents. I don't even, I can't even imagine living through what they've lived through for three years, based on the fact that it was supposed to be an 18-month project, and quite frankly, how they've been treated since it's supposed to have been finished a few months ago. Um, and so, um, I'm not sure what the legalities of all of this is, but. Um, I also got a word this weekend that to, to rub salt in the wound even further, that from early, in the early morning hours sometimes that contractor comes and takes some product that they need, some item that they need for another project. Um, so they're, they're being selective in how they remove the stuff but not taking it out like they should be doing as a responsible ongoing contractor even though having filed bankruptcy. So, so first and foremost, I hope that we are doing everything legal, legally that we can to get rid of that stuff as quickly as possible. It is absolutely um, unacceptable. Um, having said that, the, the residents, one of the residents brought up a number of things in the area that probably don't have anything to do with the contractor that might need work from our end afterwards. I'm not sure if that's the case or not. Kelly, maybe we could look at those, some of those things and make sure that those kinds of things are being lined up as well so that we don't wait to have one thing done and then start the next thing. If we can maybe be working on all of it, maybe we already are. So, um, I mean, it's a, it, it, it's Commissioner, they talk about the little park that they had. They talk about some of the investments that they made that we made. Um, and making sure that all of that's brought back up to a standard that's acceptable to them as it should be to us. Um, so that, 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 that would be, be extremely important. Um, so the, the only other thing I had to add was um, uh, the MLK event yesterday. Uh, we had one in Dunedin on Saturday. Really, really well done. Reverend Bell led the effort. Didn't realize it had been 20 years since we've been doing the MLK event in Dunedin, but. Uh, really special, um, and, and then the march to downtown in Clearwater yesterday. Um, Commissioner Latvala was there, but our guest speaker was our the county administrator, Burton, and he did a fine job. Um, but it was, it was a nice event. I didn't get a chance to walk. Did you walk I downtown? Did. Okay. Um, but it was a really, really well attended. Um, it was really, really crowded. So anyway, two really nice events. And the last thing I'm just going to bring up, um, I have been having some discussions um, uh, with different <coughs> folks about our pet stores. I know that this commission has no interest in shutting those pet stores down um, at this point. But I also understand that there are improving or increasing standards that not only we're holding ourselves to, but that we should be having holding our pet stores to as well. Um, I'm hoping to, to get by and see uh, Mr. Brightwell uh, soon to talk about what some of those things are, but we can't sit back and let um, performance that is substandard. And so I'll be looking at that a little bit closer with uh, Doug. I am actually going to be looking into some of the facilities. Um, I just want to make sure that they're being that those animals are being treated the way they should be being treated. Uh, if we're going to allow them to operate that they're doing things the way they're supposed to be doing. So um, just stay tuned on that because I do think, everybody around this table I'm sure feels somewhat similar in terms of required standards that we have, but maybe improved or increased standards that might be necessary to protect our animals. Um, but I'll bring that forward soon. Thank you, that's all I have, Madam Chair. Commissioner Long. Uh Thank you, Madam Chair. Actually, I'm still trying to process what Commissioner Eggers just said because we've spent a lot of time on pets and animals and complaints about those. And it seems to me 
that rather than as a commissioner, we undertake our own investigation of the pet stores, that we ought to ask Doug Brightwell, Barry, or Commissioner Peters, if that might be on your radar, to come in and give us an updated presentation on just where we are and turn over those complaints to them, right? I mean, I don't know, because if all seven of us start out doing that, I think that might be a bit problematic, or maybe I just understood you. No, 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 that's, a, that's kind of where, where it is. I mean, I've just been getting an influx of, of information, and some of it is I've, I've accepted some, some calls and more dialogue about it and more education about it. And so uh, it, it, it's bothersome enough that I wanted to put it on everybody's plate, but I, at the same time, haven't done enough investigation on my own. I've had a couple of brief discussions with Doug about it, um, and there are some things that we're doing in our new expanded facility that are going to be an improvement for those for our animals that we that we house. Um, for one is having cages that have bottoms to the cages instead of having people, you know, the people, the the animals. They're like people to us. Uh, the animals standing on that, standing on a on a on a surface um, in their cage, as an example. Um, and that's not a requirement. And so um, I just wanted to look into it a little bit. I have no issues with him coming forward and maybe having at a workshop discussing some of those, some of those standards that, that we might be, might be able to look at and consider going forward. So um, I, would, I would agree with that. Um, I just wasn't necessarily prepared to, to bring it yet, but he's got some information already, so. And if I could just follow up real quickly mm -hmm. for the benefit of the, the chair, maybe, I don't know. But I know that the last time we had a, a public discussion on this issue, we had a lot of folks that were from, not from Pinellas yeah. County. And I personally, I don't mean this to sound the way it's gonna sound, but we're Pinellas County commissioners, and I think to take up our time to listen to folks that are from outside the area on this issue. We can't fix everything beyond the borders of Pinellas. And yes, we can, you know, Correct. lend our voices, but I'd like to see our conversation with Pinellas County folks. I would um, typically and most of the time agree with that. Uh, and 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 I, we've all taken lots of emails from folks within Pinellas, but also in the state, right. around the country. Uh, yeah, and I, and I certainly country. don't want to necessarily open this up to give every, every advocate an opportunity. I have had a chance to talk to one person that's in Hillsborough County who I've found her letter to be extremely measured, uh, well thought through, and, uh, and that's who I started opening up some conversations with. I'm not, I'm not trying to make any... I'm not going to speak for that person because I think in that person's world, they would all, the, the, the shops would go away. A lot of counties have done that. Uh, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about raising the standard within the stores that we have to a level that uh, we, that should be done without much forethought, without much thought. Um, and so I just like to have that discussion rather than have the discussion about whether they should stay open or closed. Um, I think it's up to us like when you're counseling an employee sometimes, to tell them what we expect, what we expect it to be improved to before we go to the extreme of closing, a, closing the industry. So anyway, I would like to see what kinds of things that could be considered. Uh, I'm willing to side with you and bring it forward to discussion here if the chair will do that. If not, um, I'm gonna pursue it anyway. So, so um, I know it's Commissioner Long's report uh, right now, but Barry, did you have something to say? Well, the, the conversations you have with these organizations, Doug has the same conversations with them. Um, and so if I could suggest you, certainly Commissioner Eggers could meet with Doug um, and collect any information. Um, but why don't I have Doug present a report back to you in writing um, to all seven commissioners? And I, then you I, can decide if you want to bring it forward for a workshop, you know, or not. I, I have some thoughts on this, but I'm going to wait till it's my turn, and then, uh, then I'll share them. Um, so I'm going to wait on that and let you finish your report. Oh, that was, that was really all I wanted That's to I just wanted to react to okay. Commissioner Eggers, because 
where there's a little smoke around him, there's usually a flyer mm -hmm. coming. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just want to see what. Good to know. Good to know. <laughs> he might um, be willing to say. <laughs> Commissioner Flowers, have you got a report for us? Um, I get a report and maybe a or question. Updates. We received, um, all of us received an email um, from Shane Crawford about perhaps our engagement, our participation in the LIV um, mm -hmm. golf tournament, um, requesting some financial support. I didn't know if anyone had looked at that more in depth or if staff had been able to look at it since it may be an economic opportunity. I don't know the particulars. I'm just asking. Yeah, I, I did refer him to visit St. Pete. Correct. Because okay. that's that's the mm -hmm. that's the arm that yeah. does big events, mm -hmm. um, and so I referred him to Brian to get the information whether they're eligible if it's a time frame and all that. So I did refer him over to okay. to Brian. Just curious, um, just to um, report, we had a wonderful like many other communities. I saw a number of emails and, and just some wonderful pictures about the celebration for Dr. Martin Luther King Day on the 15th. Um, I chaired the National Council of Negro Women's event that had over 850 attendees, so I am tired um, <laughs> at that, but it was a very good event. The parade um, in St. Pete, which has been cast as the largest parade in the nation for MLK Day, I believe when they count those numbers, it's gonna be far more than that, because it was huge, and it, it seemed like it was going on for days, but it was huge. But I also like the family fun component piece that they put in it where it is certainly um, children friendly. <clears throat> the weather was a little iffy, but it was certainly children um, friendly. So just wanted to share that like many others. And as uh, Commissioner Eckers said, Happy New Year, ready to get to work and get to seeing what we can do with some of these preemptions that have already flowed. Well, not completely flowed, but certainly are being heard in committee. Um, in Tallahassee, even when it comes to the Live Local Act, when it comes to uh, being able to um, possibly increase the amount of um, award uh, when suing a, a governmental entity, I think now it's 200,000. They're looking at raising that amount to 400 to 600,000. Um, looking at um, the ability to um, have certain cases where uh, attorney's fees and whatnot are to be paid by the uh, non-winning side, um, how that may, you know, hurt some individuals or maybe even stop them from seeking legal support and advice because if, in fact, they lose, now they've got to pay the other side's legal fees um, uh, as would be required if this bill were to go through. Some good measures on um, affordable housing, so I'm excited about that. Um, and it's just a number of other bills, but you know, the Florida Association of Counties puts out its legislative update, its legislative tracker. So if you want to keep up to date on what's going on there. And um, as far as where NACO uh, stands um, with the Army Corps of Engineers, that hasn't necessarily, um, I have not seen that as a platform for the current president, but I do know that as you all have gotten calls and we've, tried to reach people from all over the state of Florida because this issue is a state issue for all of us. Um, just trying to get as many people as possible to weigh in. Um, the legislative fly-in or the federal fly-in to DC um, hopefully will address some of that as well as um, coming together with a sound statement as one body from the Florida Association of Counties. We're hoping that that also does something. So feel free to um, continue to read those legislative um, action updates from the Florida Association of Counties, and we'll see you in Tallahassee if you come. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, Commissioner Scott. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, last week I had my, my last meeting as, as chair of the uh, Six Circuits um, Juvenile Justice um, Circuit Advisory Committee Board, so that was uh, um, nice to kind of close that down and shift that over, transfer that over to Commissioner Latvala, who's gonna be handling that for, for the next year. And um, I want to wish Commissioner Latvell and his new wife, you know, a great, uh, great life uh, together. Uh, it was a very beautiful ceremony, and witnessing Commissioner Latvell's dancing prowess was just <laughs> amazing. Can't say enough about that. <laughs> However, he did take lessons. He, he did shared. Take lessons. Yes, he did. Six of them. Yes, he did. Um, and also, uh, very happy to report that um, the Palm Harbor Main Street program 
uh, was successful in securing their first grant uh, for $6,500 to create a strategic plan for the historic district. So congratulations to Louise Getz for all of her hard work on that. And I'm looking forward to my first Tampa Bay uh, water meeting uh, next Monday. So I, will, I know I will see Commissioner Eggers there. Yes, you're going to learn a lot about water. Yes, I will. Yes, I truly <laughs> enjoyed serving on that committee. Um, you all done? Okay, so I, I really don't have anything to report other than, um, again, I want to thank the sheriff's deputies that come in and watch over us and make sure everything is safe and okay. Uh, we have Deputy Winnick uh, here and Deputy Butterfield, and I just can't thank them enough for all the work that they do and their, and their service to the people of Pinellas County. Um, regarding pet stores, now I met with the pet stores and Martha with the SBCA. And um, he had a proposal that would take pet stores above and beyond any regulation that would ever take place that I've ever seen. And he merged a, a partnership with the SBCA to have a veterinarian come into his pet stores every single week and check those animals out to make sure that they're safe that the SBCA would visit his breeders to make sure the breeders were doing everything that's within the law and above, um, and to ensure that no breeder was leaving a dog that was uh, past time for mating, um, that they would find safe homes and not just be dumped like many are, or tied to trees like some are. Um, and so I thought that they th that was a partnership that was an unusual partnership that to me, went above and beyond to ensure that the retail and the breeding industry was, was doing better than any regulation could ever have. Now, it was my opinion, based on the letters and the calls we got, that they were angry and wanted Martha to lose her job because she was assisting a pet store to be legitimate. And, I, I, and they went to great lengths and had people calling from around the country for her job because she was going to legitimize um, and ensure that the regulations far exceeded above and beyond because it's retail sale. And I believe if we eliminate retail sale, that we are going to just build a black market for pets that is only going to make it worse and worse and worse for animals without their safety um, and their well-being at, uh, at the forefront. And so um, I, I understand their passion. I do. I completely understand their passion. Um, to me, the bottom line they want is retail sales gone. My opinion is if retail sales go, we have a black market and it's worse because you're always going to have people that are going to want a certain breed and that's never going to go away. Um, but I think how they handled um, um, this partnership, um, I, I thought was, I, first I was shocked and appalled because I thought that they would be thrilled that we were ensuring that any pet store um, went above and beyond to ensure the wellness and the well-being of an animal, um, and yet they went out for blood and just wanted somebody's job. And, and so I, I have real issues with, with the tactics that they used. Um, and I think, it, it, and even when they came to speak, they talked about um, the county and how many you know dogs were whatever they're they're killing or whatever, or they're euthanizing. But at the bottom line, before they were done speaking, they all went to retail sale. They all eventually went to retail sale, which tells me their motivation was strictly retail sales. Um, and now you have one county that just reinstituted re bringing pet sales back. So where they got pet sales eliminated in counties, counties are now bringing them back. So, um, so I, you know, if you want to look and see if our ordinance is really following through, my intuition is. Um, based on my meeting with them and the fact that the SBCA had started to do all these things and that, and that he wanted this. He wanted to ensure that the public knew that he was only using good breeders and he was taking great care of his animals. Um, Who is he that you're referring The owner of the pet retail sales that we have here. I don't, have his, I don't remember his name. I think you mentioned it. Um, so I don't, I don't have his name off the top of my head. But the fact that he was willing to do a partnership to go above and beyond so that everybody knew that his animals were well taken care of and it was all about the benefit and the health and safety of these animals and the breeders and the animals from the breeders. I mean, what, that partnership that he forged, I thought was just magnificent and I thought that would be a model across the nation. 
and that the bad breeders that are not in Florida, Florida doesn't have an issue with bad breeders. Um, there's other states in the country that do have issues, but when when retail sales made a partnership and an agreement like they made, I just thought that was incredible. Um, and then for it to end because of the pressure to have her fired because of that partnership, um, which awesome. now degrades, you know, I, I don't believe he's going to step back. I think he's going to still uh, keep that high standard in every one of his stores. Um, but what a shame. What a horrible, horrible shame. Um, because it really could have been an amazing model for the nation to ensure that all breeders were doing good things for the health and safety of the animals and that all retail sales were going to do this. And they, they, they actually followed a model in a uh, university. So if you're going to dig into it, and if you want to invite him here, I'd be happy to do that and have him bring in and Martha. Well, Martha probably won't because... You know, they're still after her, her job. Um, but they based this whole thing on a, on a model that a university uh, did research on, on how we could do this to make sure the health and safety of the animals. Um, and they, they derailed the, that group, derailed it, and had people from across the country That's calling for right. her job um, because they just don't want retail sales. That's and wrong. so I think it's wrong. Um, and again, if you want to meet with the owner of the pet stores and see what he's doing, I think that's great. I think you'll be very impressed with what they're doing. I'm sorry they didn't meet with all of you to see what they were doing. But um, I, I, I was so excited about it. I thought this just ends any concern. And if they really were so concerned about the health and well-being of the animals in retail, that they would have been thrilled with this partnership. That they, they should have been thrilled with this partnership. And so I've, I've bit my tongue because I just don't want to start up that thing again. Um, I, you know, I love animals. I want the health and wealthy well-being of these animals. But, um, but to me, the agenda is retail sales. They always get to the bottom of the line before they're done speaking about retail sales. And I think retail sales elimination just creates a black market, which, which is inexcusable in my opinion. So there's my opinion on that. You know where I'm going. If you really want me to pursue it, I'm happy to put it on a workshop agenda so that we don't have two hours of people talking about it, um, you know, to come and do their comments on it again. Um, but I, and I, I really encourage you to meet with the owners of the pet stores, um, and I'm happy to get, this, get his name and get you hooked up with them. Um, but I, that was an alliance I never saw happening, and I was so impressed that it happened. And I'm so incredibly disappointed that it has now been destroyed. Yeah. So well, I, go, go ahead. Go ahead. So what would be, and uh, this is a staff question, I don't really know, but why wouldn't we, if you were so impressed with, I see Doug sitting over there listening with bated breath, why wouldn't we take that standard and try to move it into some kind of a requirement for our we certainly could do that. And if I can, someone wants to open yeah. a business. Well, I mean, we, we have an ordinance that we can't open anymore. But the fact that the, the, that's what our ordinance says. Open more stores. We can't open more stores. Oh, but yeah, okay. But I mean, we but can amend it. We can. Um, and, and if there was that kind of practice, I, I would be okay with that. We'd have hours of commentary not allowing us to expand it. But... Um, but, you know, and Doug certainly can make a comment on that if he has an opinion on it. Maybe, maybe my opinion's completely off base. Um, but, um, you know, I met with Martha and her staff, and she showed me photographs of them going to the breeders to see these animals and how they're being treated, um, how the accommodations are. I mean, their veterinarian was going to those stores every single week to make sure. Well, I, I mean, that to me was above and beyond. But again, if you want to pursue it and, and look at standards, um, I would recommend we get that model. I forget which university it was. Um, and, and maybe take a look at it if that's what you'd like to do. And that I would consider, and I yeah. would consider it in a workshop. Yeah, that's um, all. That's, I'm, not, I'm, I'm really not trying to open up the retail sales piece of it. And I understand how that gets hijacked sometimes. It does. Um, so when we do have a workshop, it's going to be more discussion for us to, okay. to talk through what the, that model that, that, we're, that we're alluding to might be so that we can um, pursue that standard improvement yeah. that got, if you, to, to use your words, hijacked, if you will, away from trying to improve the situation. Yeah. There's no reason why we can't do that on our own. 
No, that's true. That's true. I don't know how we'll find a partnership like they had because I don't know anyone's going to go put their job on the chopping block because they're partnering with retail sales. Um, it's really unfortunate. But um, yeah, I'm not quite sure how that was marketed internally between um, any time you have the, 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 the person, in a sense, being the regulator, talking specifically to those who regulate, it just raises questions. Not my questions. I'm saying I thought I agree with you. I thought there were some really good things that were being proposed. But that was, whether it was legitimately raising concerns or questions or whether they were just using it as an argument on the retail sales side, mm -hmm. uh, that's, yeah. I, I can't get into all of their motivations. All I'm, I want to bring it back to, do we have the best ordinance possible to make sure that our pet stores that we're allowing to stay open um, have, you know, have the standard, that, the maximum standard that we can afford them? Um, and, you know, I'm sure we're trying to improve our standards as well. So it right. shouldn't be any different for them. So that's all I, that's the part I wanted to talk about. Okay. So, Madam okay. Chair. Um, Commissioner Long, then Commissioner Scott. Well, my, I'm, I'm going to be quick. I just see that Doug is here, and maybe he knows about the what we're talking about. I don't know if he does. And I would love for him to come up. Let me let Commissioner Scott okay. have his thoughts. And if you want to come on up, because we're going to want to hear your opinion. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. And I met, before all of this stuff hit, hit the fan, I met with, with Martha and the owner of Sunshine Puppies as well. And I was, I was impressed and excited with what they were doing. It sounded, it sounded you know, good to me. And then with, when all of this stuff just came out of nowhere, this yeah. hurricane of, of public comment, I didn't, I didn't quite un, un, understand where that was coming from. But you're right. The bottom line seemed to be you need to get rid of retail sales. And that's not something I'm ever going to support. Because I, I agree with you 100% that that's just it's just going to create a black market. Um, and I even talked to my vet about it and asked him his opinion, who's been a vet in this Pinellas County for decades. He said the best thing you can do is know who the players are and regulate them. Right. And do do drop-in visits. You know, he said that's, that's the best thing that, that you can do. I am all for, if we can elevate the, the standard of care for the welfare for the animals, I'm all for that. I mean, you know, if we can do that, we should do that. But, you know, I mean, to say we're just going to put people out of business because people don't like that, business model is not something I'm for. No. You know, so. no. And this commission has made it clear that they're not for that. Right. Yeah. Um, where did Doug go? He's right there. Well, there he is. He was trying to hide. All right, so you heard us all. Have you got any thoughts? And, and yeah, I'm sure we can look into increasing the standards, but I really would like you to meet with the owner of Sunshine Puppies. Afternoon, Commissioners. Doug Brightwell, Pinellas County Animal Services Director. Um, in the two years since we and dealt, dealt with this the last time. We have learned a lot, as well as the pet stores have, and you all have. Um, I am aware of the standards from Purdue University that you're discussing. They were not publicly accessible to us. Those standards were not publicly accessible two years ago when this came about. Um, I have been able to get those and look at them now. So I think we do have additional standardized information that we can consider. And I talked to Commissioner Eggers about that previously. Okay. So, can we? Uh, so, so could you um, send that out to all of us so we could review it? Um, that I, standard, that university? I don't have report? a written copy of it. I, they were able to go over it with me on the phone. They're still very protective oh, okay. of Martha, the Because Martha, I thought had a, I thought Martha. But I will see if I can get a copy of that for Okay. Me. But I've not been able to obtain a copy myself. I've been able to discuss it with us. Okay, okay. And um, have you, did you meet, well, you were familiar with what they were doing. Yes. So you, you met with them or you just? With the, with, with the uh, Sunshine Puppies and, and SPCA? I have met with the SPCA and the other director leaders as well for the other organizations, but not directly with the puppy store owners on this particular issue. Okay, okay. All right, thank you. Thank so, you. Um, so do you want me to have him look into that report on what we could improve on? Okay. Okay, so if you're okay with that and maybe kind of look into, it might be worth a conversation with Martha to see uh, after she did that for a period of time, what worked, what didn't work, where improvements could be, um, what, what is never gonna work <laughs> that they think would. Uh, I think it would be worth having that conversation with her. Um, and, um, and I think it's even worth having a, a conversation with the owner of Sunshine Puppies because it was his idea to do this. So, you know, he's not opposed to stronger 
regulations. And, and he really wants the public to know that he's got quality products. Way, way back. So, um, so it's, it's worth another visit just to hear about it. But uh, if you'd like that, I'm, I'm willing to do that in a workshop. I'd like to hear it. Yeah, okay. Everybody agree? Okay, okay. so I'll, I'll have to get you a report. Um, so he'll do his you know, due diligence as you just requested, provide your report, and then we'll schedule it for a workshop. Okay, thank you. So I don't have anything else for the good of the order. Anybody? Madam Chair. Yes. I'm sorry. Um, can I please, for the record, get the board to vote on the um, oh. Sunshine Skyway resolution? Yes, yes, yes. Sorry, I, I, that was my oversight. Um, so you can see there's a, a three, two and a half page list or so of organizations that we have approved in the past. So we want um, a motion to approve these. Move approval. Second. Second. So we got a motion from Commissioner Flowers, second from Commissioner Long. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Um, and any future ones that will come up, we'll do as usual. So thank you all very much. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Great meeting.